hello. Praise the Lord. My family. As you guys notice, there's a little thing happening with the lights, but uh, don't worry, it's just a distraction. We press through distractions. So we are in the light right now, praise the Lord. So we're just going to roll with the punches. Amen. Jesus is the light. That's right. And uh, we are in the light as he's in the light. Well, greetings today and thank you, Pastor Caleb. Uh, I know he's, uh, he's with his dad this weekend. What a great opportunity. And uh, we got the Dave and Dave duo today, uh, but it's all about our Father in heaven. Amen. Amen. It's Amen. Father's Day. I want to uh, start by way of introduction. Um, I am the father of Pastor Dave, and I've been hanging around him for the past about uh, 36 years or so. And uh, anyway, I've got a few other children out, out here scattered abroad around the world. Um, I have five other uh, sons and daughters, and... Um, and they also call me dad. I'm honored and privileged that they do. And also seven grandchildren that call me papa. And I'm so glad that they do that as well. And they're growing. And I have a beautiful wife of 43 years, my pride and joy, Pam, who calls me anything she wants to call me. Amen, after 43 years. Praise the Lord. And so uh, uh, by way of brief introduction to ministry, I know that Pastor Caleb shared uh, a, few, uh, a few feats of uh, uh, of, of ministry that we were uh, tackling throughout the years. But I pastored for about 25 years, uh, a couple different churches, uh, both in the Bay Area. We pioneered as well, San Francisco. And uh, currently, I'm privileged to be a chaplain in active duty in the U.S. Air Force in the Air National Guard. This ministry is a blessing to me. It takes me all around the state, all around the world. And uh, literally, uh, I'm privileged to serve uh, in a combat search and rescue uh, unit, and uh, that team is involved in saving lives, and we're making a lasting difference on humanity, both physically, spiritually, in hostile nations and nations that are friendly, but uh, um, what a blessing it is. And um, my relationship um, to this church goes beyond uh, my son being on staff here. Uh, I've known Pastor Caleb and Pastor Rachel for at least uh, 20 years, I think. And uh, John and I were trying to do the math this morning. I'm not great at math, but it's been, a, it's been a while. And it's been a good while. And so we share all, uh, as AG credential holders, we share in the fellowship of fulfilling uh, the great commission, preaching the gospel, the whole gospel around the world. What a great, Man. what a great mission that is. And uh, um, as he empowered us to do so, and I hold uh, them, that is uh, the pastor staff here, and, and Travis, I don't forget you, and all the rest, we start mentioning names, you're going to get in trouble. But I hold them in the highest regard uh, and uh, count it to be a great privilege and a great honor to be on this platform with you today, this pulpit. Uh, David and I would like to entitle this message, A Father and Son's Heart. A Father and Son's Heart. Uh, I'll start uh, by sharing, if that's okay. Absolutely. Okay, uh, and I know we have, uh, we, we gotta watch the time a little bit, to this, this one, yeah, okay? I'll take care so of it. So this is my work. second one this morning. I went a little long, so... so old I school you. Pentecostal. Right old here. school Pentecostal. Yeah, Buckle up. Three hours. <laughs> Minimum. And an altar call, friends. And anyway, an call. so I want to... Uh, I just want to just say um, uh, uh, the title, but I want to say that I have not been in any way, shape, or f uh, form a perfect father, but I was sanctified enough... Uh, to model and mentor others uh, for the task that is set before us as believers, both young and old, uh, lay leaders, and of course, parents and elders. Um, also, I want to expose this morning the Father's heart uh, towards all of his children, help us to better understand God's never-ending, relentless, irrevocable, unchangeable, tenacious love that he has towards us. Amen. I want to share some of my own experiences, both of fathering and, uh, and being fathered, and we'll give uh, hopefully a few bullet points for continuity and clarity for uh, preachers like to give one or two or three points. But I want to, I want to start with this, little, uh, with this little card that I came across about uh, 
oh, about a decade or so ago. And, and it goes like this. Maybe some of you have, uh, have heard it. Uh, when I was four, I said, my daddy can do anything. When I was five, I said, my daddy knows a lot. When I was six, I said, my dad is stronger than your dad. When I was eight, my dad doesn't know exactly everything. When I was 12, I thought, oh, well, naturally, dad doesn't know anything about that. He's too old, and he doesn't even remember his childhood. At 14, I said, I'm not paying attention to my dad. He's old-fashioned. At 21, I thought, my Lord, he's hopelessly out of date. At 25, dad knows about it, but he's been around for too long. At 30, maybe we should ask dad what he thinks. After, he's ha after all, he's had a lot of experience. At 35, I'm not doing a single thing until I talk to dad about it. And at 40, I wonder how dad would have handled it. And at 50, I'd give anything if I were able to talk it over with dad one more time. Too bad I didn't appreciate the small things and the big things that I've learned from him as much as I could have. I lost my dad at age 23. Maybe some of you have, have also lost your fathers today. And, and maybe your dads weren't the greatest dads. I had a wonderful father, but I lost him to cancer. And, um, uh, you know, he passed away while I was, uh, I, I was able to come back from overseas. I was away for about three years before he passed. And then before that, I, I was raised in, in part by my uncle. And so um, I didn't get all those deep, intimate conversations that I really would have liked to have as an adult. Some of you may have experienced that. Maybe you lost your fathers uh, at a young age. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to be able to really, uh, you know, get into to David's mind and heart and soul and spirit. And he's able to to really glean from me as well, and we're able to share and have that relationship, both as a, as, a, as a young child, but also as a parent, it's a blessing. I would not take that for granted. Do not take that for granted. And, uh, um, you know, so you fathers out there, uh, you know, mentor your sons. Major decisions I wish I could have talked over with my father, uh, uh, but I, I, the Bible says to love and appreciate your parents. So um, this week in preparation for this message, I asked the Lord, uh, to give me a theme. And the reason why is because your pastor asked me to come up with a theme. And I thought that was a pretty good idea, right? He, he said, Pastor Dave, I'm giving you the floor, okay? But I, I, need, you, I, need, I need to know what you're going to, you know, at least be talking about. And that's us, us pastors. Sometimes we have different methods and, and, and modes of preparation, you know, where some of us are about going away somewhere, finding a good coffee shop, or maybe out to the desert for a few weeks and just, you know, waiting on God, praying for the word. And, and maybe some of us are just more uh, extemporaneous, you know, we shoot from the hip and we just have something ready to go at all times. And then some of us really just have to really, it just has to come in a, in a slow way. And for me, you know, it just doesn't always come instantaneously and easy. Sometimes it does, but I have to wait on the Lord. And sometimes I get a little nervous, but I just kept waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Lord and praying, saying, Lord, what, what theme, what, what, what message do you want me to preach? And as I was praying and I was waiting, um, the word of the Lord came to me, and it came via a shiny chariot-like vehicle, but it was really a retro 1968 Ford Mustang, with a license plate bracket on the back that said this, when the going gets tough, the what? Oh, that's Vince Lombardi. Good job. But that's not what it said. It said, when the going gets tough, call dad. Wow. When the going gets tough, call dad. Not 911. Not Google, not Siri, not Pastor John or Pastor Travis, but Dad. I like that. I like that for a lot of different reasons. There's a spiritual connotation there. There's a practical connotation. I like that blue-collar theology. And uh, something that touched my heart, and I knew the minute I read it, ah, yeah, our Heavenly Father, call on Him in the time of trouble. This poor man cried out to the Lord, and the Lord heard him and delivered him from all of his troubles, Psalms 34. But church, God established, and I want to make a strong point here, God established 
the office of fatherhood, and no man, no Congress, no culture, no clergy will ever be able to wipe out that anointed title that God has been given, our almighty Father in heaven. The God who reveals himself as Father is not ashamed, he's not offended, and he's not nervous at that sacred title. And I wanted to get that one out of the way. Amen? Okay, let's not do away with that great title, Father. Jesus in the garden, Father, save me from this hour. Father, on and on and on in the ministry. And we honor our mothers as well. And, and, and those titles are so important and, and those positions. And, but today, guess what? Fathers, we're getting the trophy. We're getting the trophy. Hallelujah. God established that office of fatherhood. And, um, you know, no, uh, no man can take that away. Now, perhaps you're like me, some of you. Uh, I wasn't really prepared to be a father. I, um, when I first got married, in fact, I was a little nervous about being a dad. I knew I wanted to get married real quick, but I, I wasn't quite prepared uh, for fatherhood. In fact, I was a little bit naive and a little bit non-committed as to when we wanted to start the process. However, we did want to have children. Pam and I loved children. We taught, taught in children's church, and uh, we, we had a, a ministry when we first came to the Lord to children for over a year in Colorado Springs. We just grew a huge Sunday school class. Our, our pastors were incredible, and we started a bus ministry. It went from 80 to 450 every Sunday morning. That was some work. And our church exploded in Colorado. It was just incredible. Little children. We, we enjoyed that, that ministry for a year. And we worked with Teen Challenge there. And, um, but uh, we love kids. And uh, they're, they're, they're special. I told the group this morning that, you know, yesterday I, I attended a, a funeral from one of a uh, gentleman in our unit. Lost his son while he was deployed. And, and we, had to, we had to put to rest a little four-year-old. Skyler, and I want to appreciate and thank you for your prayers for that family, the Choi family, um, to lose their little son. It was, it was very difficult yesterday. And um, this little boy loved Jesus so much. He was so precious. And as a matter of fact, and, and we didn't even know this until the Korean pastor who was doing the translation, he, he shared this, uh, this, this message about him that during uh, this little boy, Skyler's, uh, uh, you know, four years old, he graduated from preschool. It was a preschool graduation. They just so happened to have it on, uh, on video. And uh, he was just kind of roaming around the sanctuary and the school. And all of a sudden, he comes up to the mic and he's praised this prayer, this little four-year-old boy. And he says, Jesus, I love you. Mommy and Daddy, I love you. Church, I love you. And, and this, they capture, capture this on video, and he says, thank you, Jesus, amen. And he puts the mic down, he walks away, and people are like, wow, where did that come from? And just hours later, he's in the presence of the Lord. And my daughter, Sarah, had a vision of this little boy, Skyler, walking down a road, holding the hands of Jesus as he went down the road. And, and as I was going to the this particular funeral and this service prepared in uniform, another service member called me and told me he just lost his one-day-old son. And I thought, man, our children are a gift from the Lord. And I'm just so thankful that my children are serving Christ and that we put them above ourselves, above our own needs. I know a lot of people are out there worried about how we're going to do it, how we're going to make it. But... Um, I'm thankful my, my children are serving the Lord today, and I'm, I'm grateful by the grace of God, and I don't take them for granted, nor do I take my grandchildren for granted. But we waited four years and, uh, to have our firstborn, and Sarah came along, and she was a beautiful girl, but Pam had a very difficult pregnancy with Sarah, um, especially her labor, and we immediately wanted more, so Pam became pregnant, uh, you know, after that, we, we just said, okay, this is working. This is great. But uh, unfortunately, we lost the first baby through miscarriage. So we, we tried again, and we lost the baby again. We said, Let's, we tried again. The third time, we lost again. And the doctors labeled us as habitual, or my wife is a habitual miscarrier, and uh, probably would never have children again. They meant well when they said that, uh, but we were crushed. We were perplexed. We were going through PTSD pregnancy. We, we, we didn't know what to do. 
And at that particular time, um, we were at Glad Tidings. I was in Bible college my senior year. I was on staff doing a, an internship. Glad Tidings Church. Hello, Chimacol family, by the way. Guess who we ran into there? Now, their family is so big, and our family on Father's Day, we get together. We can't, they like to go to the lake. We did a pontoon boat once, and when our two families get together, that boat sinks. I'm telling you, we have a lot of kids and a lot of family. I'll show you a picture in a few moments. But anyway, what a blessing. I was at Glad Tidings Church in San Francisco and um, do an internship. And Mel Johnson was the pastor, and his daughter, uh, Denise, who, uh, Denise Johnson, who's now Denise Ryan, a missionary and uh, a mother herself, had a word from the Lord. And she wanted to give that word to us. Uh, but she was a little bit nervous about giving that word. And so she decided to go to leadership. And I'm supposed to foot stomp that, right, Pastor John? No, we talked about that this morning. You know, if you have a word from the Lord and you're a little bit, you know, nervous about sharing that word, it's always good to go to your leadership and say, you know, I feel like God's saying this to me. But anyway, she went to her dad and said, you know, I feel like God is telling the Shinoni family they're going to have another baby. But I just don't want to hurt them. I don't want to, I don't know how to tell. And she went and told us, and her father said, you know, I think it's okay that you're going to tell them that you're going to have another baby, and it's going to be a baby boy. And so she mustered up the, the, the faith and the strength that she shared that with us. And lo and behold, lo and behold, almost nine months after she shared that with us, came along this healthy, strong, full of joy, Right here, bundle of joy, right here next to us. And needs to say, amen, God is faithful. He knew we wanted a big family. And uh, all of a sudden, along came Andrea in the back. And then all of a sudden came Anthony in Florida. And then came Daniel in Florida. And then came Emily right here in front. And all of a sudden we had to say, okay, Lord, our blessings our blessings are full. You have, you have you've blessed us so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Our quiver is full. And I think we have a picture up here somewhere of, uh, of uh, our family. This is our, 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 yes, this is our family right now. These are all my children and grandchildren. Minus, I think, baby Hannah. And there might be one or more. I don't know if they're all in there, but I think that's pretty much pretty accurate. And so we are, we are so, so blessed. Um, I think there might be another picture in there of, of David and I, but uh, I, just, I, I just share that with you. To hopefully, it'll help you along your journey to believe. And some of you I'm speaking to, some of you have gone through some of the situation. I just was a little bit vulnerable with you. You know, sometimes when you share your story, you become vulnerable, but that's okay. Uh, the older you get, guess what? You don't care. <laughs> Hallelujah. You don't care what people think. It's a gift, isn't it? It's a great thing. Anyway. So I am conventional in some ways, and I want to make sure that we get to the Scripture. And, uh, and so I want, to, I, want to, I want to pass the Scripture that, that uh, I felt also very strongly about, and I, and I got that word stand as well as the word call dad. And that word stand came to me, S-T-A-N-D. And if you have a Bible or tablet, turn with me, if you could, uh, to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 18, and I'll do some editing. Um, particularly verses 1 through 18. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you will live a long life on earth. That's a promise from the Lord. You want to live long? Honor mom and dad. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline of the Lord. Skip down to verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you will be able to stand against all of the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you will be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to do to stand. Stand firm. Therefore, having belted your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having strapped on to your feet the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, in which you will be able to extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take up the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, with every prayer and request, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be alert with all perseverance in every Request for all of the saints. Wow, what a portion of scripture. 
Ephesians chapter 6. You know, I wrote my thesis on that in, in one of the colleges that I graduated from. As a chaplain, you got to go to a lot of colleges. doesn't mean you're smart. You just have to go to a lot of colleges. And I had to write a thesis, and I blame that. You know, i I, I got to admit, my wife typed that thesis. You know how many pages it was? It was 142. Oh, yeah. And back then, we didn't have computers. It was hunt and peck. Thank you, Pam, my wife, servant of the Lord, amazing woman. You know, she was in the ER the other night, and even the doctor stopped and said, that woman is a rock star. She's a nurse, and she's a, she's a blessing, and she's my rock star. That's a powerful scripture. Now, I know not all of you are fathers here, but uh, if you're a father, a spiritual father, a father figure, would you just do something? Would you please stand? If you're a father, would you please stand? Amen. Let's give him a hand. I want you to know something. Dads, fathers, you are highly esteemed by God Almighty. Your office of fatherhood is highly esteemed, and you have an important assignment from our Heavenly Father. Thank you so much for what you do. You may be seated. And now fathers of faith, teachers, mentors, father figures, you can just wave. For Some of you are also taking up the slack where some of those dads aren't there. Maybe they've lost their sons and you become a, a father to the, to the fatherless. Hallelujah. What a ministry. What a heart for God. That's what God wants men to do. And that's a whole nother sermon. But dads, we get the trophies today. Amen. It's okay. We love our moms. We love mothers, what they do. We could never do what they do. Greatest in all the world. But today it's Father's Day. And we're going to honor our Heavenly Father as well. Now, fathers of faith, mentors, keep going, keep doing it. Having done all that there is to do to stand, standing is the battle position of every believer, especially the believing father. Paul uses these military metaphors to emphasize that we are in a battle, a battle that he has already won. A battle that you and I will win as we put our faith and our trust in him. And that is a battle in human-to-human -human relationships. We must meet requisites. The requisites that Paul gives us here are very important. In children and parent relationships, in husbands and wives relationships, in workers and employees relationships, we must be filled with the love of God, with kindness, with long-suffering, with intercessory prayer. This is having done all that there is to do to stand when we have these relationships in order. Are you following me this morning? Yeah. Then we can have victory over the enemy and all of his distractions and all of his devices and all of his attacks when we have done all that there is to do to stand in these areas, when all hell breaks loose, and all hell will break loose, by the way. I, uh, I wasn't quite ready uh, for this uh, enlistment into the Christian faith. I mean, I, I came because I didn't know where I was going to spend eternity. But I was not quite prepared. You know, it was like when I joined the army. Come on, join the army. We're going to give you three square meals a day. We're going to give you a place to stay. We're going to give you a nice bed. We're going to give you a little condo. Then tell me about going to Afghanistan. They didn't tell me about going to Iraq. They didn't tell me about going to being deployed and, and, and having to put up with quite a bit. But here's what, they, here's what the good news is. When we said yes to the Lord, he brought all of heaven's resources with it. And when all hell breaks loose, and it will, if you're a born-again believer in God's army, amen, track with me just for a moment. I'm in the Air Force, by the way, but I did serve in the army. If you're in God's kingdom, if you're a born-again believer, if you have the Spirit of the Lord in you, if you're born of the Spirit, if you're a child of God, you need the whole armor of God. Amen. You will need to stand. In 2006, I was diagnosed with a lethal dose of lung cancer, and this intense trial uh, lasted for almost a year of treatment and recovery. It was an intense battle. And uh, I almost lost my life, but the enemy couldn't take my life, could he? You see, he has to ask permission of God before he does anything. Just remind him. And remind him also, when he reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Amen? I know that's an old one, but hey, just do it because it's, it's, so, it's so appropriate. 
because he's a liar, a loser, and he's accuser of the brethren. He accuses you of things, and he reminds you, and he uses your own, your own, your own memory sometimes. Say, oh, I can't look how, what kind of a person, how could I, I did this, I did. We need to stand. In 2006, this trial came upon me. He couldn't take my life physically, but the enemy found another way to try to destroy me. Some dumb, stupid financial decisions that I made almost totally sunk me, tore me, my life apart. Financial collapse, physical collapse, spiritual exhaustion, demonic attacks on family, relationships, friends, board members, children, children going sideways, children backsliding. All hell broke loose in 2006. They say 2020 was bad. My 2006 was just the beginning of victory. Let's put it that way. And believe it or not, this is kind of normal for the Christian life. Again, you kind of learn that after a while. You would never probably even ask the Lord. You, you, you know, sometimes it's just so funny. I remember the day I got saved. I didn't have a care in the world, by the way. When I came, when I came to the Lord, I didn't have a care in the world. I was happy. I was happy, go lucky. I was getting, getting, getting married to her. I was in the army. I had a job. But I didn't know where I was going to spend eternity. That was the one question I couldn't answer. And that plagued me. But the minute I signed up in the Lord's army, I was on a honeymoon for about three weeks, four weeks. And then all of a sudden, the enemy of my soul, hey, I didn't read a part that, about that part yet. He came after me. But, folks, then we have to read the whole story, the whole book, and understand the whole thing, that we have power and authority over him. And once we learn that, we can stand in the evil day. Amen? Amen. Amen. So this is a part of what it is to be a believer. And we stand not alone. We stand together. We're a church united here in Marin County. You don't stand alone. You'll never stand alone as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You might not have an earthly father, but you have a heavenly father who will never leave you, nor will he ever forsake you. And you have a family right here today that will stand with you through every trial that you face. But standing is difficult. Standing requires discipline. We don't give up when we stand. We don't give up on our children when they backslide. We pray for them. We love them. We pray for their restoration. We don't banish them for life. We leave the door open. We may need boundaries, but we love them. That's standing. We don't give up when we're sick. And the doctor tells you you have a short time to live. We stand instead and we believe by faith and God's supernatural power to heal and deliver. We don't give up on relationships. We allow love to find a way and the love of God to begin to, 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 to intervene in that marriage somehow, some way. We stand. This morning, more than anything else, is there anyone here today that's broken? I've been broken so many times. I, I put Humpty Dumpty to shame. You know, the king's horses and the king's men couldn't put them together, but Jesus put me together. Hallelujah. He did it perfectly. And I want to say to you, if you're broke here today, if you're beat up, if you're backslidden, maybe you're just battle fatigued. I want to say some good news. First of all, you're not alone. You're not alone. And then secondly, thank God we have a God who hears us, our heavenly Father, who can deliver us from any trial, any tribulation that we face, or every fiery furnace that we're thrown into. Amen. Now, David. Amen. You, th you thought I was going to just, you know, keep gonna going, didn't you? No. <laughs> I'm going to be a good dad the second oh, service. Thank you. All right, you're buying lunch then. So long. All right, okay. so listen, before we get started, God bless you, David. I want to thank you for standing with me when we went through that great trial. And my sons and daughters all stood with me. They all, you know, they, those crazy kids, you wonder, where in the world are they? Do you ever think about those parents? Who raised this bunch of kids? And then all of a sudden, when the going gets tough, 
Hallelujah. They called on their heavenly father and they stepped up to the plate and they rallied around me and they prayed for me with a godly wife. Don't worry, I'm almost through here. He's getting up. <laughs> and, and you know, I, I just, I'm gonna close it this way. I did get three points in my, four, point number one of my sermon. Here we go, I'm done. <laughs> point number one, having done all there is to do to stand, we stand. Point number two, having done all that there is to do to stand, we stand. Point number three, having done all that there is to do to stand, we stand. Hallelujah. Amen. David, thank you for standing with me. And we want to hear from your perspective how God delivered all of us through that fiery trial. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Dad. Yes. Um, truly, guys, I tell you, I've been blessed to have such good parents. Um, and my dad really is my hero. Um, and uh, I don't say that lightly, but I've had good parents. I've been blessed to grow up in a Christian home. And I know some of you... Um, haven't had that. And I just want to say, I know this is Father's Day. And I know for some people, Father's Day can be a painful day um, because maybe you didn't have a father or maybe your relationship with your dad <clears throat> wasn't maybe the best. Maybe they were abusive. But I just want you to know that you have a heavenly father who loves you, who has never forsaken you, and he will never leave you. And uh, all you have to do is call upon his name. And so that's just a little bit about what I wanted to, I just wanted to cover you guys with that. If this is uncomfortable, you know, it's, I know it's Father's Day and we're honoring dads and I wanted to honor my dad. I also want to honor my spiritual dad, Pastor Caleb as well. Um, and uh, he's given us the reins today and I'm so grateful and I'm honored guys. For me to be up here with my dad, I can't tell you how much that means to me. Um, he, this, this thing he's talking about in 2006 really shook our family. And like he's talking about, little did I know that was only really uh, the beginning of, of life for those type of things. But the man that he was when I was a boy helped me become the man that I am today. And I'm really grateful for that, Dad. So thank you. And I love you very much. My dad, if you were going to give him a scripture and tattoo it on his body. I did that when I was younger and he got really mad, it was hilarious. Um, <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not condoning, but you know, I got him too. Uh, anyway, uh, I would tattoo Luke 16.10. Whoever is faithful with the very little will also be faithful with much. My dad was not the type of guy that just preached on Sunday and then went home and was a different person. Both my parents were who they were on Sunday at home as well. They practiced what they preached. <clears throat> and they actually were a little extreme. We grew up in San Francisco, uh, being pastors in San Francisco. And my, my family, we were labeled radical by the rest of our relatives because uh, my, my mom and dad got saved in the Jesus movement. And, you know, my mom was a hippie. My dad was in the army. And now they become these radical saved people. And they're all about Jesus. And uh, sorry, mom flower child. You know it's true. <laughs> but growing up as kids, my parents, like, they used to, um, they really made us walk out this Christian life. It wasn't just something that we were, like, reading about in the Bible stories. It was like, when we got toys, they would make us give them away every Christmas. And, and no, it sounds, I mean, we were like, what? What's going on? But then it was weird, because God would have somebody bless us with new gifts every year. And I grew up with these type of things. And I remember my dad gave our car away to a missionary and we didn't have another car. But he was just like, God will provide. And what I didn't know is he was, he was teaching us faith by walking faith out. And he was doing it in such a way, as, if you wonder why I'm so extreme, it's because my parents are pretty extreme. Um, and I, I, he taught us to believe for big things. And lo and behold, Boom, somebody would buy him a car and say, God told me to buy you a car. And so that's the type of parents I grew up with. And it was really powerful. And, I, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, and, and I have countless testimonies and stories of them giving away their money and their cars and our stuff and, and, and ministering to people. My dad, when I was growing up, you couldn't go into a store with him without him telling at least five people about Jesus. 
And as little kids, we used to get <laughs> really frustrated because he, he, would, he would just talk to them. And even if they didn't want to be talked to, he just kept talking to them. <laughs> And uh, it's funny, Franny, <laughs> first service is like, I know where you get it now because I talk a lot too. And I do the same thing to Violet now. I, 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 <laughs> she's like, come on, Dad. I'm like, oh, hold on. Have you, do you need prayer? You know, start doing the same thing. It's funny how the older you get, you start to turn into your parents. And the things that were annoying to you are the things that you do the most now, which is something I'm definitely guilty of. But I'm grateful to have the parents I had. But I also wanted to give you guys maybe a perspective of a, you know, a son from this, this life. I grew up a PK serving in church, and I started in the back doing the sound. I think I was really young when I started doing that. And as, as PKs, we did everything in the church. So you needed to clean the church, that was us. You needed to play on the stage, look at Emily. <laughs> we started them young. All my, most of my siblings play uh, worship of some kind. And praise the Lord, all my brothers and sisters are serving the Lord. But that wasn't always the case, okay? Wasn't always the case. And even though we had good parents, um, there, was, there was trials and tribulations in our life where you, know, you, you, you turned away at certain times. I'm gonna share a little bit about that time in my life. And it just so happened to be the time when my dad had cancer and I didn't know this. But I would just turn 19, I was uh, going to the Santa Rosa JC and I was playing football and I was working really hard to get good grades. And I was going to church serving. You know, I'd go to church, serve, do everything I was supposed to do in church. Um, and then I'd go to school. And it, I, it seemed like every professor or teacher, at least it seemed this way, it's like they had an agenda against God and Christianity. To me, it, I, I felt like every class was an opportunity to just uh, talk about how God's not real and how Christians are, you know, whatever. And it, it's funny because I was so stressed out about that because I needed good grades and I was the type of person, I grew up with radical parents, so I'm pretty bold. So I'm gonna be like, yeah, I'm a Christian. You know, I remember my PE teacher asking if anybody was a Christian just to give their little rant on why, you know, God's not real. And so this was really hard on me and I really, I really, uh, I felt like I needed mentorship and, and, and discipleship at that time. But sometimes when you're the pastor's son, people think you're good on the outside. And I wasn't bad, I didn't do bad things, but inside my heart was hardening slowly because I was just serving and not really absorbing anymore. But I wanna encourage you guys with this. If you have loved ones in your life, that maybe aren't serving the Lord right now, never give up hope. Never give up hope. Let me tell you, this guy used to say to me every time, stick close to the Lord, son. And I would be like, Psh, oh my gosh, dad. <laughs> but you can ask Johnny, it was like an arrow piercing my heart deep down inside. On the outwardly, I was like, whatever. But it stuck in my heart. And all those things, all those seeds planted by them. And I'm telling you guys the same thing. All the things that you do, all the words you speak and love and the message you share with people about Jesus makes a difference more than you could probably see. But don't give up and don't give up hope. So anyway, I, I came to church one Sunday and I was wearing a hat. Back when I grew up, you didn't wear a hat in church. It was like a big deal, right? So, but I was hurting. My professors were, you know, really bashing God and saying all this stuff about Christians. And I was stressed out and overwhelmed playing football. I wanted to get a football scholarship. So I, I had to work really hard academically, which wasn't my strong suit. And physically, you know, you're working out hard and you're training. Um, and I was sitting in the front row and I, I came like, oh man, I really need somebody to pray for me and just love on me today. And the opposite happened. <laughs> Somebody walked by me and they said, you would think the pastor's son would know better than to wear a hat in church. I sat in front to get prayed for. And let me tell you guys, I was so offended. I was like, justification. All my professors are right. Christians are just, oh. I'm not even gonna start saying, I can't even pretend. Because now I love, you know, it just, it's changed. But those little, those darts that they were throwing 
that the enemy was throwing, it kind of took hold in that moment. And I used that offense as an excuse to harden my heart towards church and God. It was a season of my life, guys, that I regret, but I'm also thankful for because it's, it's really helped me have a heart for young adults. One of the groups I'm, I oversee here is the young adults, the 18 to 30s, and that's a vital time of life. And I really just wanted to encourage those of you that have people in your life that aren't believing to never, ever give up on them. Never give up hope. Do not measure your, your ability to uh, minister because God is ministering to them through your prayers and through your words, and you just have to keep on fighting. So have you ever noticed that people who don't believe in God that you're friends with call you when uh, they're going through something <laughs> and they ask you to pray to the God that they don't believe in? <laughs> that happens to me all the time. Um, and it's just, it's a funny thing. I think deep down inside, they know that God is real. Deep, it's easy to say God's not real when life is good. It's easy to say you're an atheist when you don't have a loved one facing death or yourself. It's easy to do that when everything is good. So me, this strong football player, division one scholarship on my way, team captain, power lifter, I'm doing good. I started to lean on the world and the mentality of results. And I, I wanted to get results and I turned my back on the church because I wasn't getting the results I wanted in church which what I thought was, I need to be served. I've been serving my whole life. When is somebody gonna serve me? And I came to church with a bitter heart, and, and I don't wanna share Johnny's story, but we both were kinda like this at this time. And, um, but what ended up happening is, one day my dad takes me in the room, and he tells me that he has lung cancer, and his dad died of lung cancer, and his grandfather died so the men on my dad's side of the family died young. And that was in my mind. And let me tell you, all that bitterness, all that nonsense meant nothing. Because my dad was facing death. And my little brothers and sisters were looking to me now. And I wasn't ready. You, I don't even know if you can be ready. Um, and I remember going to the church because we lived on the church property. I remember repenting and, and feeling really guilty. And I, as I was there repenting and praying, I, all the times my mom and dad lived out their faith when I was a little boy, God was like a, reminding me of their faith growing up. And uh, my dad was having his right, his right lung removed. Uh, my mom was in the hospital with him. He couldn't speak. And uh, my older sister and I were watching my brothers and sisters and we all got a terrible flu. Um, and nobody wanted to be around us. <laughs> so there was like no church people, no family. It was so bad. Like people were like, oh, oh, we'll pray for you. So we felt really alone. And I remember this wishing I could call him. I, but I couldn't because he, he couldn't talk. And I was, I was like, I, I just was thinking, oh my gosh, is this is what it's going to be like when, if he dies. And I remember my dad telling me a story when I was a little boy. He, um, when he was doing his internship in San Francisco, he used to tell us that God will always protect you and keep you safe. And he said that um, all you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord and he'll save you. He always told me this as a little boy. And I started thinking of that story when he was, uh, he was doing, I don't know if you're ministering on the streets or going door to door telling people about Jesus and a gang surrounded him and he told us this as a little boy. Um, and he, I think he started speaking in tongues and they ran away or something like that. <laughs> I went to. <laughs> but I started thinking about this stuff. And I, I, I started to pray and I started to declare the scriptures. I started to cry out to my heavenly father. And 
I'm telling you, when you do that, your faith gets stirred up. When you're alone and you, you know, when you're facing things that in the natural look like it's impossible to overcome, our God is a big God. And the word says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, will be saved. I know that some of you have lost people and so have I this year. It's been rough, it's been really hard. I don't have an agenda, but I do have a desire to call upon the name of the Lord for all of you. Amen. Some of you know my testimony, and I know a lot of your guys' stories and testimonies. And I want you to know the things that my parents taught me as a young man built a foundation in me that grew and stayed in me for the rest of my life, even when I turned my back on, on God. Those things you say, as a person of authority, take hold. So never give up on your lost loved ones. Never give up. And I know that, you know, some of us are facing things that can be life-threatening, and I want you to know, we stand together, and we call upon the name of the Lord, and we believe by faith and I had to do that for my wife in 2019. That, that thing with my dad, I had to do that with, for my dad. I had to call upon the name of the Lord and I was so broken and I was fasting and I was crying and it seemed like it was the end and I asked my uncle to take me to the hospital to go see him because I felt like he was gonna die. A spirit of fear came over me and I started to think about all the generations of my family, the men that have died young, like a generational curse. This was going through my mind and I, I begged my uncle Joe I said, please, you know, take me to go see my dad. I couldn't, couldn't handle it. I've been fasting and praying and crying. And when I went to the hospital to see him, he couldn't speak, and I wasn't allowed to get too close to him because um, but we all had the flu and we were getting over it. And, and he, back then when they took out your lung, they, his scar is huge. I mean, it goes from here all the way down to here. Now they just make a little hole. They had to break his ribs, so it was really bad. It was, it was brutal for me to see him like that. And um, I started to become really fearful in that moment in the hospital, and I went in the bathroom. I went in the corner of the bathroom. I think Pastor Travis talking about the throne room. <laughs> Sometimes that's real. Um, and I got on my knees and I, I, I started crying, Lord, please save my dad. Heavenly Father, save my father. Don't take him. And I started to pray against the, the generational curse of, young, of uh, the fathers dying young in our family. And when I walked out of the bathroom, I saw three angels surrounding my dad. And each, each one of them had a different armor. God answered my prayers. And in that moment, I knew that from that day forward, I'm gonna serve my heavenly father. And there's nothing anybody can do in this world to turn me away from him. I wanna invite the worship team to come on up. Guys, thank you so much for bearing with us. It's hard to have two guys speak, but my heart today as a pastor of this church and as a son, I really want to pray with you guys. I want to call upon the name of the Lord together. I wanna believe God for your lives, for the things that you're facing and for the loved ones that you have maybe in your life that aren't saved. I wanna believe God with you today. And I wanna call upon his name together. And I wanna invite you guys to the altar. I'm gonna have my family come up and pastors in the church, please. And I want to just offer prayer. And I want to just cry out together, guys, in unity. And I believe that if you're online today and you, you need prayer, please put it in the chat and we will pray for you. Because we want to believe for you as well. Because God isn't limited by this room He's not limited by technology. The lights can get turned on and off and we're not gonna stop worshiping. 
We're gonna press on through. If there's one thing this man taught me, it's how to fight. And you don't give up when you get knocked down. And sometimes you get knocked down over and over again, but you gotta keep on getting up. And if you don't have the strength, then you need somebody to stand alongside you and hold you up. And if you don't have the strength today, if you don't have the faith to believe, we will believe for you. We will pray with you. We'll press through together and we'll declare the glory of God over your life. And I'm believing God to touch you today. I'm asking the Lord, I'm asking the Lord to come into this room. I'm asking for the presence of the Lord to come into this room and for people to be set free and for people to be healed today. And I'm gonna ask my dad to just pray a prayer. And then I wanna invite people to come to the front if you would like prayer. We'll pray with you. Thank you, David. I got a good idea. Let's call dad. When the tough gets going, come on. Come up, come up, we can pray. Those of you who need prayer this morning, stand up to your feet, please. And as we worship the Lord, don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. We're all in this together. There's no superstars on this platform this, this day. We're just human beings that have gone through trials and battles just like you have. And you all have testimonies just like we have. We just got a little vulnerable with you today and we're able to share some of our stories. God is with you today. We're going to pray. We're going to believe. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for your sustainment. I thank you for your presence here today, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that the scripture declares it all when it says that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We run to you this morning with our needs, with our, our hearts, whether we're fathers or sons or daughters or sisters or brothers or we're a part of the family of God. And today, Lord, we cast these burdens upon you. We pray this very moment now, as those altar workers are praying, Lord, that you begin to stir, stir our hearts. And as we begin to worship this morning, I pray that miracles would begin to manifest. I thank you for the word last week that we received from Sister Rachel. As, as the tongues came forward, I know in my heart I was supposed to speak out that there will be power and liberty in this place. There'll be signs and wonders in this place, but I didn't share that. I held it in, but I thank you, Lord, that she preached it anyway. And I pray this morning, Lord, as we close, that people, as they go out, Lord, some to enjoy their family and their, their Father's Day, Lord, thank God. But for those who are desperate today, who are broken or in need of a miracle, I know you're going to meet them here today. Bless those who need to go, Lord. But for those who want to stay, I pray for that miracle, Lord Jesus, to manifest even now in Jesus' name. Let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah.